Access to Democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center and medispa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. With service built around courtesy, dignity, and respect, Mayo-trained Dr. Charles Crutchfield personally treats each patient and is acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. True Stone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served its members since 1939. True Stone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. True Stone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Edina Eye Physicians and Surgeons, a division of Twin Cities Eye Consultants, has proudly served the Twin Cities for more than 55 years now in seven convenient locations. Using the most advanced technology combined with human touch, Edina Eye offers comprehensive services and dedicated specialists committed to excellence with innovative procedures and expertise for the most advanced eye care. Hello and welcome to another edition of Access to Democracy. I'm Steve Francisco. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome to our studio today a new guest. We think he's a new guest. <laughs> he may have been here before. But uh, Kevin Lindsay is the Chief Executive Officer of the Minnesota Humanities Center. Kevin, welcome to Access to Democracy. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today, Steve. And as we're going on the assumption that it may be your first appearance on Access, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, like where you grew up, where you went to school. Sure. Uh, I was born in Omaha. Uh, my parents decided to move to Chicago to sort of pursue some opportunities for my dad working for United Airlines. So I really appreciated the opportunity to be a flight kid for a little bit. Um, Decided to go to the University of Iowa because it was actually closer to my parents' house in uh, the suburbs of Chicago than Chicago uh, uh, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, enjoyed myself there. That was probably the last time for some of your uh, fan, uh, some of your uh, watchers that are football fans. I think that was probably the last time Iowa really had a good football and basketball <laughs> team at the same time. Um, so really enjoyed myself there. Uh, went to law school. Uh, graduated and then came to work for a law firm here actually in the Twin Cities and have stayed ever since. Mm -hmm. So I've had a chance to work in private practice, have worked in-house as an attorney for a company, have worked in state government, uh, have worked uh, county and have argued cases there on behalf of uh, Ramsey County. And right before becoming the CEO of the Minnesota Humanities Center, Yes. I served as a commissioner of human rights for the state of Minnesota. And were appointed by Governor Mark Dayton, I believe, correct? That is correct. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about your legal background. I understand that you worked in civil litigation and employment, product liability cases, uh, health law, before you joined the Ramsey County Attorney's Office for a stint there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I view myself as first and foremost of always practicing employment law, which came in very handy when I was the Commissioner of Human Rights for the state. Um, products liability was uh, some of the work that I had uh, taken on when we started doing some work for the large automobile manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So the idea of, uh, <laughs> just kind of dating myself here, as it relates to sort of like airbags being mm -hmm. newfangled things and should they actually be used. And it's been going on for quite some time as to pros and cons of that. Uh, it seems antiquated now uh, to think about all the things that cars can do. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I first cut my teeth, that was still uh, an issue which was uh, out there. The new American, thing. The new thing, right? right. The Americans with Disabilities Act, I can remember the first one. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, brand new in 1991. Um, and talking about what that would then mean for employers, and my goodness, could we actually have workers working at home and remote sites? <laughs> I mean, again, sounds very antiquated now. 
uh, looking back on it. But that was the cutting edge issues at the time. Working at home, something we all became familiar with these past two years during the pandemic. Many of us were able to work from home, but a lot of people weren't. You know, if you work in healthcare, you're a first responder, you had to show up to work. No, that's exactly right. I mean, there's obviously different approaches for different employers, but right. I think just the, the generalized concept of a supervisor being able to actually supervise and manage someone who they didn't necessarily see come in the office at 7.30, 8 o'clock on a Monday, mm -hmm. that was antithetical to sort of management practices back in the late 80s right. and early 90s. So let's talk just real quickly about your time as Minnesota Human Rights Commissioner. Commissioner, what would you say was one of the biggest challenges you saw as commissioner of that department? Well, again, going back uh, in time, um, at that point in time for the state of Minnesota, um, we did not have quite the revenues we currently have within the state. Mm -hmm. We had significant unemployment. Um, the overall unemployment rate was somewhere between 8 to 10 percent. Mm. And then for African Americans, it was a little over 31 or 32 percent. Mm. There was a report out from the Economic Policy Institute, Dr. Algernon Austin, where he compared the 25 largest metropolitan areas to examine who might have the greatest disparity between individuals. Again, race is a social mm -hmm. construct, mm -hmm. but between whites and African Americans. And unfortunately, the Twin Cities was number one on that list. And then I think um, there was also concerns as to, uh, again, how we work together um, as one and see a common vision for the respective state. There were some tense feelings um, of should uh, some of the things being done by President Obama be followed or not, mm -hmm. and we were starting to see some backlash as to some of the things that he was proposing. So coming in, well I should say one other thing within that space is that we also had two constitutional amendments. Mm -hmm. So we had a constitutional amendment where we were trying to uh, ask the question of everyone uh, concerning who might have the right to marry someone else. Mm -hmm. And then we also had one on photo identification and voting. Right, requiring voters to produce uh, an ID before they could vote. That's exactly right. Fundamental constitutional right. And both of those amendments failed, fortunately. No, that's exactly right. And I had an opportunity to go on tour uh, around the state. And what we did during that is, uh, again, I would go on stage. There would be someone who would be for both constitutional amendments. Mm -hmm. And in not nowhere near quite Lincoln Douglas, but just sort of the <laughs> idea of having a debate on these respective issues. Right. And I think people in Minnesota really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Josie Johnson, who was part of a conversation with me on voting, I remember a conversation with her about two months before the election, and uh, she was very appreciative of our efforts, and she thought we would fall short mm -hmm. concerning photo ID. Mm -hmm. And I just remember how happy um, and ecstatic she was that Minnesota was one of the was the only state during that election cycle to defeat such constitutional amendments. You know, Kevin, I think for a lot of people, I actually worked on that came campaign door to door with, mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of other Minnesotans, thousands of other Minnesotans. And at first, when people looked at that, I thought, well, that's simple. Why shouldn't I have to produce a photo ID when I vote? Mm -hmm. But when you started explaining to people who, who would potentially be disenfranchised by doing that, then you could see the light bulb turn on. They'd go, oh, I didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. That this is not as simple as some politicians were presenting it to be. And there were some unintended consequences and that may well have been part of the reason those went down to defeat. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your appointment to the Minnesota Humanities Center. What is the mission of the Minnesota Humanities Center? So the Minnesota Humanities Center is a nonprofit entity. So it's not sort of being appointed as I was as Commissioner right. of Human Rights. Right. So Minnesota um, was one of the very first states to kind of raise its hand and say we want a state affiliate with a national endowment for the humanities. So many people know the National Endowment for the Humanities because we might watch a film on baseball right. or on jazz they do great and we see. Work. Right. <laughs> um, but when you look at the totality of what the humanities centers do and the National Endowment of Humanities, um, it really is about uh, sharing stories. Uh, that help us make sense of ourselves as we all travel through the journey of what it means to be a human being. 
it helps us make stories as it relates to our family and our friends and our culture and it helps us make stories it helps us understand the stories and that's really what i always think judicial opinions are their stories mm -hmm. <laughs> as to how we decide the construct of government in our lives mm -hmm. and for us at the minnesota humanities center we like to think of uh, building a just society so our vision is a just society that's curious connected and compassionate curious that we come to conversations with open hearts and open minds that we see hear, listen and understand one another and really appreciate one another and we think about ourselves within a democracy and that's really what it's about is that people making a social contract with one another is you're important you think i'm important Let's work together to figure out how we can create right. a better society together. You've said something that um, I think is a really strong statement. You've said that the Minnesota Humanities Center, and I'm quoting you here, mm -hmm. is among the first responders when our democracy is in crisis. Many people have observed they believe our democracy in, is in crisis right now. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the current crisis of democracy? Well, when I said that and wrote that as well, uh, I was responding to the death of Mr. George Floyd at the mm -hmm. hands of um, now the convicted uh, former police department, uh, former police officer Derek Chauvin. Yes. And I thought it was really important for uh, organizations such as ourselves that really play a role in facilitating conversations on democracy, on civics, and how we work together um, as. Uh, loving individuals creating kind of a beloved community to kind mm -hmm. of step forward at that respective moment. Um, I wish that things had dissipated, but I, I would say that unfortunately we still kind of feel at a, a fever pitch on various respective issues. Uh, we still seem to be having some difficulty uh, listening and hearing and understanding one another. Mm -hmm. um, and the work kind of continues within it. And I'm really appreciative and grateful for all the folks at the Minnesota Humanities Center and at my fellow colleagues of other humanities centers around the country that are leaning into that space. We see things happening here in Minnesota and nationally today, things such as attacks on voting rights, a little bit of which we talked about just a moment ago, mm -hmm. election denial, Mm -hmm. not respecting the will of the voters, mm -hmm. the rise of extremist hate groups, mm -hmm. white supremacist groups, mm -hmm. banning of certain books in schools, limiting school curriculum so that they can't talk about certain difficult subjects like the history of slavery or what was done to Native American people right here in Minnesota and across America, the displacement of Native American people. So how can the Minnesota Humanities Center help us address these kinds of issues and get to a point where we can at least begin having dialogue with our fo uh, fellow citizens so we have a better understanding of the contributions of all of these different groups that have made Minnesota what it is. Yeah, so one of the things, uh, there are many things that you mentioned there that we have leaned in or sort of mm -hmm. been a part of. So let's take voting for example. Uh, E.J. Dion and Miles Rappaport came to Minnesota and we facilitated a conversation and dialogue on uh, how Minnesotans feel about election integrity. And within that space, uh, all issues were addressed. Uh, no one was diminished for any particular view, but similar to the conversation that we had on the Constitutional Amendment Tour, mm -hmm. uh, we shared other parts of history and I think sometimes when people are presented with history and they are presented with facts what they feel maybe from a nonpartisan lens they're able as John Meachin says huh I didn't think about that maybe I should think a little bit more on that so yes we do lean in within that respective space you talked about um, how we understand in indigeneity right mm -hmm. in indigenous nations here We've uh, had a trip called the Bedote Trip, where the confluence of two rivers come together mm -hmm. in the Dakota and Ojibwe um, traditions, and that is sort of the genesis, the start of life. So we talk about uh, Fort Snelling, we talk about Pilot Knob Road, um, we talk about that from the lens, or Mounts Park, we also talk about it from the lens of Dakota and Ojibwe people. And we've been doing these kind of learning from place events all throughout Minnesota to give people a little bit of a different perspective of Dakota and uh, Ojibwe uh, people. We've also published books on a variety of different cultures. We often lean into writers, poets, um, artists uh, from different cultural perspectives that some people might not be aware of 
That's resulted in publication of books like the Minnesota Native American Book Series, mm. uh, Mr. Rondo's Neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had various people coming in, such as Angela Tate from the Smithsonian Institute, talking about Juneteenth and the history of Juneteenth. Uh, we were just up in Duluth. Um, one of our uh, humanities officer, Rose McGee, she had mm -hmm. written a play, Kumbaya, uh, about a couple years ago. And we're now sort of bringing that back to the fore with the passage of Juneteenth legislation of a federal holiday. Mm -hmm. More than uh, 1,200 people uh, got to see uh, two shows that we did, a morning one for students and then an afternoon one for the public. And that was a great space for us to be in conversation. That's so, great. We just had a interview recently with a candidate for the uh, Burnsville City Council, Crystal mm -hmm. Fitchett, and she, mm -hmm. mentioned, she mentioned that Burnsville was one of the first cities in the state of Minnesota that actually had an official city commemoration of Juneteenth. So it's important that people, many people hear these stories, they're not even aware of this history. <laughs> and, and so it sort of underscores the importance of talking about and telling people, educating people. No, that's exactly right. So we were very fortunate to get a chance to partner with a federal court here, uh, Chief Judge, at the time, Chief Judge Tunheim, mm -hmm. and then various members of the various affinity bars and the Federal Bar Association. And we did a program uh, where we centered the story of the lynching in Duluth. Mm -hmm. And we talked about uh, other events from the 1919 uh, Red Summer uh, mm -hmm. and subsequent period after with the Tulsa Massacre. But then we uplifted a story of the blinding of Sergeant Woodard. And a lot of folks aren't aware of the blinding of Sergeant Isaac Woodard. But that blinding and subsequent case prompted President Truman to issue an executive mm -hmm. order to desegregate the military. Mm -hmm. So we had Judge uh, Richard Gergel from South Carolina. A lot of folks know Judge Gergel because he was a presiding judge in the Dylan Roof uh, murder trial, mm -hmm. but his predecessor was the one who presided over the uh, case on uh, Sergeant Woodard. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book on that, and uh, it was this great presentation to be able to tie things that were going on around the country at the time of the lynching, as well as the history of violence and how we have been able to overcome and sort of step forward within mm -hmm. that period of time. Still work that needs to be done. I don't want to dismiss that. Right. But it's, it's important to also remember where progress is made right. to continue to kind of pour in so we can go out and do more work. Let me ask you, uh, Kevin, we hear politicians throwing around terms like woke, wokeism, uh, mm -hmm. cancel, we hear about cancel culture, we hear attacks on so-called critical race theory. Mm -hmm. And when you hear politicians use these terms, mm -hmm. a lot of the time, it's not meant to bring people together. It's meant mm -hmm. to divide people further. Mm -hmm. Say something, if you would, about that, about politicians' use of terms like that. And what is your understanding of these terms when you hear wokeism and cancel culture? Sure. So one of the things that you had mentioned was critical race theory. Yes. So um, American Bar Association published a paper on this uh, maybe two, two and a half years ago. My research conversations with other lawyers and professors within it. Critical race theory is really a legal theory. Mm -hmm. um, it really grew out of the legal tradition. Um, it is unfortunately been used by folks that not wish to talk about race in our country. And well, even more than that, to prohibit some states are legislating against teaching certain curricula that would educate students about some of our racial history and some of the inequities. That's exactly right. So it went from, uh, we think the critical race theory is being taught and we think the way that you talk about race is painful for some of our, our children to hear. Mm -hmm. And now it has gone to the next step to beyond that to say that we don't want to talk about anything that has to do with race yeah. at all. And then this ties back to what you were saying about woke or wokeism, right? And this idea that somehow we're talking about something new that never existed in the United States, and therefore it's a delegitimate. It's not legitimate, mm -hmm. right? And therefore to be doing this within the education system is not the direction in which to go. Uh, unfortunately, 
uh, we still have folks that just sort of deny sort of the impact of race at the formation of our country. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go back to the, ar even go back to the Articles in Confederation before you go to the <laughs> convention, you see how prominently race played an issue to this extent that there were certain states that did not and would not sign on or agree to be unless they could continue the peculiar institution of slavery. was portrayed in the uh, movie 1776, where the South Carolina delegate says, I will not sign this unless you strike the provision that would have abolished slavery at the beginning of the country. And mm -hmm. uh, we've been living with the legacy of it since. We fought the bloodiest battle in the history of the United States was fought over this. But you have people now coming up with the idea of, Oh, no, it wasn't really about slavery. It was about states' rights. Well, yes, to the extent it was about the right of a state to allow human beings to own other human beings. Right. But now the debate, you know, you have certain governors in America, like the governor of Texas and the governor of Florida, who have recently said, oh, we have to ban teaching of critical race theory in our schools. But public elementary schools mm -hmm. are not teaching this. What, what they're talking about is banning discussion and teaching about slavery mm -hmm. and about the country's racial history. And you also hear them say, well, tr liberals are trying to teach mm -hmm. people to you know, hate white people right. when you're dealing with this issue, which of course it's not meant to make people feel bad about themselves necessarily, but it's to have a better, fuller under understanding of what our history is and how we have gotten to this place and that we still have inequities and to be addressed. No, that's exactly right. To that issue of book banning, just to bring it home locally. Yes. So Duchess Harris, uh, many folks know Duchess because of her relationship to uh, hidden figures, mm -hmm. uh, family yes. members want to but she's Great written, story. Yeah. yeah, she has Great written woman. a ton of books, mm -hmm. and many of those books are now on banned lists around the country. Yeah. So again, it goes beyond just simply talking about slavery. This the idea of race. At, at, well, at I all. always subscribe to the idea that you live in a free country, and when people start banning books, we're going down the wrong path. If you choose not to read a book as an individual, that's your business. But when you start trying to get legislatures to ban books from being taught in schools, that's not a place that America should be or that a free democratic people should be living in. No, but, and I think it's, it's, again, coming back to that earlier topic about being antiquated, right? Right. Because most kids, right, do they, and I understand why I am in location with Dodge is with books. They do read books. Right. But they also have a phone. They also have a computer. They also have a tablet. So this idea that somehow, that if we create this list and we stop people printing certain books that this information won't get out, that is ridiculous. Yeah. And I think, to your point, this is the time where we really should be having, again, curiosity. Why, why do you feel this way? Why do you right, think this right, way? Right? Let's actually have a conversation right. and dialogue. Right. right. Um, so yes, we, we seek to hope to facilitate that and show the way. I sometimes remind folks that many of us are parents, and I know that there's some folks that are not parents, but for the folks that are parents, when you start to say no to something, that's really when it sparks <laughs> interest. So I kind of remind people, you know, I keep, know, tell, keep know, telling kids no, Kevin, because you're going to drive them to what I want I know to my do. parents, when they said, don't do this, <laughs> that's when I wanted to do it, was right when they said that. Last year, the National Endowment for the Humanities announced $2.8 million in funding for some 56 state and jurisdictional councils to support civic engagement mm -hmm. and American history programs mm -hmm. to examine constitutional government, mm -hmm. how we govern ourselves. How is Minnesota and the Humanities Center carrying out that mission? Well, there is an initiative that we have undertaken called Third Way Civics. And Third Way Civics is an opportunity to kind of bridge the divide on how some folks think about uh, it either being a red state or a blue state mm -hmm. kind of a proposition. Mm -hmm. But I really tell you the key coming back to what we were just talking about mm -hmm. is we really empower the students to identify the respective texts. Mm -hmm. So it is really more of unfortunately how some of us might have been taught of information at the front of the room being told to you mm -hmm. where you're actually in charge and driving it more. 
and in that space what we have found is that there are several colleges that are starting to adopt the way in which we're teaching third way civics we just got a second grant from the Teagle Foundation we're in partnership with Lumina to expand it to uh, do more within high schools I so like that title third way <laughs> that's an interesting interesting concept there mm-hmm well for us, this is not diff new space. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not too far uh, from some high schools in which we have brought in some of our work on why treaties matter, mm -hmm. um, in uh, which we examine each of the treaties that have been signed by the federally recognized tribes and sort of that history of those respective treaties. So for us, creating space to talk about some of the times the tension mm -hmm. that exists and. I don't think that's saying anything controversial because that's what the founders even talked about, the tension, right, right. existing. Right. But how do you navigate that through citizens? And unfortunately for some folks, the, some of the tactics that they're undertaking, right, reminds other folks that are you subscribing to denying citizenship right. to other a folks? A place we've been before, a right. place we've seen, a place we've been in our history. And we don't want to go back to. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think most people do, but I hate to tell you I'm afraid some there are some politicians who I think they would turn the clock back. And they have supporters who would turn the clock back. And I think they have to be, we have to confront them squarely uh, with the fact and tell other people this is not where we want our country to go. I was at an event this morning talking about the investiture of our new Supreme Court yeah. Justice. And someone had made the comment that there was a congressperson that wanted to take away the votes of women and wanted to repeal uh, that amendment. <laughs> Which seems very hard to believe that that would happen within my lifetime that we're having that conversation. Sadly, there are a lot of things that um, we wouldn't have believed would happen in recent times that we've seen. I never imagined we'd see people marching through the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, giving a Nazi salute mm -hmm. and yelling obscene slogans and that we would see someone commit a racist, murderous attack in a black church. Mm -hmm. As we've, we've seen all these things happen. And uh, uh, the sooner we can put an end to that type of extremism, I think the better off our country will be. You know, I agree with that. And I think that that really is incumbent not just on one or two, it really is incumbent upon all of us. Mm -hmm. And appreciating um, how each of us can approach a conversation to build upon a next conversation right. to continue to move that forward. Um, this is not going to happen uh, overnight. overnight no. No, it's no. a building process. Correct. Yeah, building process. Well, Kevin, uh, thank you for the work that you do and the men and women that are your colleagues at the Minnesota Humanities Center. Mm -hmm. And for the people that engage with you and are willing to have these conversations. Uh, mm -hmm. It gives us a better, more fuller understanding of Minnesota, how we have become the mm -hmm. state that we are. Mm -hmm. And it's the contributions of a lot of people. It's not just one ethnic or racial or religious group. Minnesota is actually more diverse than many Minnesotans even realize. So mm -hmm. uh, a good thing to put the spotlight on that. Uh, Kevin Lindsay, CEO of the Minnesota Humanities Center, thank you for being our guest today on Access to Democracy, and I hope that you will come back and visit us again soon. I appreciate that. I hope folks will come to our website, check out some of the events that we're having. That would be great. Thank, thank you, you, Steve. Kevin. Appreciate it. Thanks. I think so.